Welcome to Balancing the Ledger, where finance and tech intersect. I'm Jeff Roberts. I'm Jen Vietchner. And today we have Adam White, VP and General Manager of Coinbase Institutional. Welcome, Adam. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Jen. As you know, it's Blockchain Week in New York. There's been a lot of news coming out of the conferences, including some from Coinbase, which we'll get to very soon. Circle, one of your competitors, raised a lot of money. We've heard uh, eToro's coming to the space and Robinhood as well. Um, how do you feel about all this competition? Our perspective is typically we want to be heads down, building the best product we can for our customers. And if anything, I think competition drives efficiency in the marketplace. It strives us to be a better company and offer better uh, products and services. But we really tried not to get too distracted to look at what others are doing and stay focused kind of on, on the vision um, that we want to build, that we want to help create, and really listen to our customers what they want from us. Another interesting item that came out this week is uh, Zcash got listed on another competitor, Gemini. And uh, that's a famous privacy coin. And it's neat to see a new coin added to the mix. What do you think of that? And do you think uh, Coinbase might follow suit? From a larger industry perspective, I think um, the addition of Zcash is a, is a fantastic uh, kind of big step forward for the industry. Because what it represents, in our opinion, is that regulators are truly beginning to understand this technology, right? They're understanding things like how ZK snarks can work and how you can uh, selectively reveal, you know, uh, different types of addresses. Um, that's a huge step forward for the industry, and I think one that uh, shines brightly on the success of privacy-focused coins like Zcash, and it's certainly something we're paying attention to. The number one thing our customers want are more assets, right? They say, Coinbase, add more assets that I can trade, and we hear that, and uh, we're very aware of that and working towards that. Just recently, kind of put out a blog post that said, here's Coinbase's process for adding new assets. So when we make that decision, we have a very small group of internal employees that, that decide that. Those employees have a very prescriptive trading provisions, right? So we're not, uh, we're kind of operating in accordance with our employee trading policy. And uh, once that group has decided, we announce it publicly at the same time we do to our company. So when we think about things like adding new assets, we can be very transparent and say, our customers want it, our competitors are offering it. That's, that's a world in which we want to move to. But um, beyond just the technical ability to integrate a new blockchain and spin up an order book, it, it has other stakeholders like regulators that uh, we need to work with in order to get there. But it is your goal long term to eventually offer more assets to investors? Absolutely. Turning to your news, Adam, Coinbase is opening up its office in Chicago. That's right. Yeah, we're really excited that we have um, an office in San Francisco, an office here in New York, and an office in London, and just announced we're opening up an office in Chicago. What's really unique about it is it's an engineering office, right? What we're looking to do is scale that office from right now to about six or seven employees to upwards of 100 employees over the coming year or so, and that will be primarily engineers that are helping work on kind of new institutional-grade infrastructure for the, the products we offer. Do you think Chicago, you think derivatives market, and also um, high-frequency trading, is this what you're sort of designing it for? I think when we think about the institutional space, we think there's core products that they want to have access to. First and foremost is custody. They need the ability to safely and securely store cryptocurrencies, especially the kind of history of the space, which is wrought with thefts and hackings and, and uh, lack of safe storage. Um, so that is a core product that we're offering. The second one, Coinbase Markets, and that is the matching engine or the centralized pool of liquidity for all the different Coinbase products, be it Coinbase.com or GDAX. Um, and that team is going to be based out of Chicago, and there's an exceptional access to kind of talent there that comes from kind of deep exchange architecture experience. So obviously the CME, the SIBO, um, you have a number of exchanges that are there, and we're really fortunate to have that. GDAX is really your baby, right? Yeah, so I, I look after GDAX. Um, that's uh, our kind of institutional grade exchange. And what we've done is um, GDAX used to allow both individuals and institutions uh, to sign up, right? It would allow direct market access. And it was either the active crypto trader that said, hey, I really want to be able to trade directly on a central limit order book. And they would do that through GDAX. But it was also very large institutions, right, that would trade primarily programmatically via our API. They would also come through GDAX. What we realized over his time is that those two customers had very different needs, right? Individuals want to kind of be walked through the onboarding experience. They wanted a very easy to use interface, uh, whereas institutions kind of wanted more powerful tools and kind of features that only institutions could have access to for legal and regulatory reasons. That's why we're really excited this week to announce a, a new product we just launched called Coinbase Prime. And Coinbase Prime, as the name evokes, is, is kind of there to provide the prime brokerage services that institutions are missing. Things like lending, algorithmic orders, and access to market data, and even research one day. So a lot of this stuff sounds like, you know, a little bit like banking services, you know, uh, where they had Goldman Sachs seeing them announce that they're going to start trading Bitcoin derivatives and maybe eventually Bitcoin. Does Coinbase see itself uh, as a bank, or what's the vision here? I think very kind of simply said, we want to be the Google of crypto. 
right? That said, we're spending most of our time and our resources right now helping to build up the infrastructure. So that's the ability to safely store cryptocurrency, the ability to safely kind of trade it. But that um, will not be successful long term if we don't also move into this utility phase. How do our customers, if not the whole world, start utilizing cryptocurrency to solve real problems, to provide real service? So we've already started making a few investments there. We've got a product called Toshi. That's a user-controlled wallet and kind of a decentralized application uh, store that you can use services on. We also have Coinbase Commerce, which allows our customers and, and businesses to be able to send and transact cryptocurrency for business. So we do not see ourselves as necessarily just a, a cryptocurrency bank, right? That's a core part of our offering, and especially as we appeal to institutions. But long term, we really want to be diversified, supporting not just the investment phase, but also the utility. You're getting into the asset management business and beefing up all your products for uh, institutional investors. So you already have a billion dollar valuation. There's already hundreds of billions of dollars in cryptocurrency as a whole. Are there, you know, is there still a lot of institutional money that's just sitting on the sidelines that hasn't come in yet? What's the opportunity here? Absolutely. And if we had to put a number on it, by our best estimates, there's at least $10 billion of institutional capital that's waiting in the sidelines just to move in for a safe custodianship product. Just for cryptocurrency. Just for cryptocurrency alone. Um, we think that by offering this suite of products, and more importantly than just having great products, you need to have great service as well. We've got here in our office um, headquarters for a new team that we're calling our institutional coverage team. That's the sales team, that's the client services, that's market operations and trading, all the uh, complementary components that institutions want to be able to pick up a phone and talk to another person. We're basing that here out of our, our New York office. We think the combination of having the right product set with the right service is going to unlock tens of billions of dollars of institutional capital, and we hope it comes through us. Tens of billions. So if just 10 billion right come in right away, but over time, this could really build. A absolutely. So we already store more than $20 billion of cryptocurrency, and that's largely just on the retail um, side of the business. That number is only going to grow as institutions come on board. All this money on the sideline, who exactly is going to come to the table who's not there already? Are we talking about like CalPERS pension fund? Are we talking about, you know, governments? Well. Yeah. Eventually one day, but I think those are going to be some of the, the last institutions to move in the space. So kind of how we've seen it uh, play out is that in the institutional space, very few want to be first, but most want to be second, right? They want to uh, kind of be the fast followers. I think we're going to look back in a couple of years and we're going to look at uh, Goldman Sachs announcement a few weeks ago that they're going to begin trading cryptocurrency is very much a watershed moment, right? You have a leader in the space saying publicly, this is an asset class and a market that we're going to participate in because our customers, our clients want it. Um, I think that is going to continue to open the door to accelerate the adoption of institutions. When we think of the types of institutions, first and foremost, it's kind of started with, um, call it the hedge fund world, both traditional kind of macro long-only hedge funds that are saying, I need a bit of exposure to this asset class, um, but also the, the rapid emergence of a new type of hedge fund, the crypto hedge funds, right, that are raising capital just to invest in cryptocurrency. You know, Polychain, Scalar, One Confirmation, these are all great examples that, that are, are standing up. Beyond the hedge funds, the kind of other uh, early adopters, I would say, is in the proprietary trading space, right? These are firms that are kind of known for uh, trading sophisticated markets, and they're looking across the cryptocurrency market and saying, there's a lot of inefficiency here, right? We're seeing uh, price dislocations between exchanges, and they can very easily kind of point their trading strategies to this new market, and I think we've seen a lot of capital come in there. What we're seeing right now is the wave of kind of call it global financial institutions, the big banks of the world that are kind of looking to say, we're going to stand up a cryptocurrency trading desk, just like we have an FX desk or an equities desk. That's going to be tremendously exciting. And I'd say last in that, in that uh, line of adoption is going to be the, the sovereign wealth funds, the pensions. Um, there's just going to be a longer process of education, market maturity, and kind of risk tolerance. What's this going to do to the price? Because it seems there are the hedge funds and so on are coming in, and yet the price of Bitcoin seems pretty stubbornly stuck at $9,000. So this is what I love about the cryptocurrency market is that we, Coinbase, operate a venue, right? We want to be the most efficient, fair place for price discovery to happen, but we don't take a position in what that fair price is. Um, I think many ways what we tend to spend more time looking at is what's the developer interest, right? How many GitHub uh, commits do we see to Bitcoin or Ethereum or other, you know, open protocols that, um, that uh, tokens that we offer trading on. We look at what's the awareness, what's the level of education. I think those things are not going to be in lockstep with the price, and anyone in the space needs to have a 20 or 30 year vision to really look at what a foundational technology like Bitcoin or Ethereum will provide. Alas, we're out of time. Adam, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Jeff, Jen, thanks for having me. I'm Jeff Roberts. I'm Jen Vietchner, and for more Balancing the Ledger, come to fortune.com. See you next time.